Okay, so please welcome our keynote speaker, Rui Kasais, who is CTO of Funcom. Funcom is a game company that has developed several massive multiplayer, um, massive multiplayer games. I know that quite a few of you are interested in this kind of technology. So I'm really happy that we have somebody here who has been in, involved in the development, operation, and the everyday running in, well, more than one of them, right? You yep. were there when Anarchy Online was no, made? Or no, you not one made. But after that? Yeah. And your latest one, The Secret World, mm -hmm. is oh, out a few months ago. Yeah. And we hope to learn quite a bit about how to make massive multiplayer games in your talk, The Technical Challenges of Developing uh, MMOGs. Please, go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I need to adjust my volume to the microphone. I I'll might have to try a bit speaking louder and lower to see how it works. So um, thank you, Carson, for uh, uh, the invitation to be here. Thank you, everyone, for having me here. I hope to bring a bit of the, the challenges, the problems, the everyday issues we encounter when making games, more specifically MMORPGs. Uh, I'll talk a bit about that. I don't know if I have to point or if it works. Uh, by talking a bit of what MMOGs are. MMOGs mean massive multiplayer online games. Uh, Funcom specializes in MMORPGs, which is massive multiplayer online role-playing games. Uh, it's quite a mouthful. But it's to say that it's, um, it's a type of games where you play online with lots and lots of people at the same time. It's a persistent world. That means the world has a state that persists over years and years and years. And the players interact with that world to somehow change their own character or the world in order to have fun. So most of you have heard of uh, MODs, MUDs, which were the text-based first type of massive multiplayer online games. And in reality, it's still the same, except now the graphic quality is very high. The gameplay systems are a lot more complicated, and players and designers and artists keep on pushing the limit on what they want to do. So not only we have more people because the gaming market has expanded so much in the last decade, but the cost of creating a game is really high. And I'll talk about that in a second. But here we see a screenshot. Oh, I think I have a laser pointer. I even have a laser pointer. A screenshot of like an old mod. This is Anarchy Online. Anarchy Online was the first MMORPG that Funcom launched. It launched in 2001. And it was one of the first in the Western world. It was the first sci-fi MMO. It's still running. So 12 and a half years later, it's still running. It's the, the world is persistent. It's an evolution of the world launched in 2001. And of course, that brings a whole lot of problems. This is a screenshot of The Secret World, the game we just launched in June last year. And there are many, many, many MMOs, the most famous of which is World of Warcraft, that not only was an immense commercial success, but also broadened the, the, the gaming industry to the concept of MMOs and made it very popular. At peak, it had like 13 million players playing every month. So it's, uh, it's substantial. The massive number in here is quite substantial. Um, what else? Yes, avatar focused. I mentioned a bit that most of these games, you control an avatar. That avatar represents you. Uh, you inter use that to interact with the game and that av avatar grows. Uh, it can be that it grows more powerful. It can be that it grows in a way that allows the avatar to do more actions in game. So it can be that if it's a warrior, uh, you'll be able to kill harder monsters. Or in some other games that are very non-combat oriented, maybe then you, the warrior can build the pyramids by using his skills. And then he's not a warrior, he's more an architect. In the beginning, maybe he can build a pot. In the end, he can build a pyramid. So it's, it's very avatar-centric in the sense that the avatar has some specific capabilities, and those capabilities evolve. And again, the avatar is a state. Um, RPG type progression means that most, ga sorry, most games uh, have some kind of progression on a curve or a, a line, most likely a curve, to encourage players to spend time. These games are all about spending time. The traditional model is that you pay for a subscription, which means you pay every month. And as game developers, we want people to spend their time there so that they keep stay playing for many, playing for many months. 
So the RP an RPG type progression means that your character goes in strength, grows in abilities, not in a linear fashion, but in a uh, curve-like fashion, to engage them more and to keep them playing longer and longer and longer. And of course, it means we need to build addiction hooks into the game so that people come back. Uh, at first, that was very common sense. What what is addiction? These days, it's very designed, and there's a lot of influence and from research in um, psych psychiatry and philosophy, yeah, not philosophy, uh, psychology and things like that to try to put the hooks that the players will bite and stay there. Um, large worlds to explore, that has always been a pattern in these games, is that the, you can spend hours and hours and hours just seeing all the places in the world. The amount of content that has been put, created, the size of the game world is are always very large. These days there are variants coming out that are less focused on having a large world to explore, but it still remains one of the big attractions with these games. So, they are big, they are complex, there's lots of stuff in them. And what we dream about is that we can actually not pay so much to develop them. Uh, Funcom has had some ups and downs, as the, especially the Norwegians in here will know. Uh, many of the ups were due to us making really good looking games, and many of the downs were because we spent too much money making them. And this is not specific to Funcom. Uh, Star Wars The Old Republic, a game by Electronic Arts that was released in January, December 2011, January 2012. They didn't release the official cost number, but the estimates from people in the industry is that it's around $200 million development cycle. It's a lot of money. It's so much money that the, the industry is, is thinking, what the hell, what are we doing wrong? costs as much as making a blockbuster a Hollywood movie. Of course, there's a lot more entertainment value in a game like this, because we're talking about hundreds of hours of gameplay versus two and a half, three hours of a Hollywood movie. But still, it's a lot of money. And speaking of movies, the, the gaming industry is now the second largest entertainment industry in the world in terms of revenue. Uh, overall gaming, not MMOs. Um, but that's a, a, side, a side thing. Now. Talking again about the Star Wars The Old Republic, it was the most expensive game ever made to date. It, the, uh, the goal of EA was to be a World of Warcraft killer, because they wanted to steal that chunk of the pie, and they failed. They didn't manage. They had lots of sales, they sold a couple million copies, but the couple million is nothing compared to the 12 that World of Warcraft had at launch. So not only they had a huge development cost, but they took chances, and they didn't succeed. So overall, the industry is thinking, how can we reduce our risk and reduce our cost? That's where I want to focus on this talk. There are a couple of issues here that are complicated, too complicated for the industry to be able to spend time on. The industry wants results fast, but some things aren't fast. And that's where the academia world is, is great, because in academia, you can spend a bit more time thinking about the complicated problems. And that's what I hope I'll be able to challenge you a bit and give you some ideas of possible research areas. So what, what's low cost? What would make my CEO happy? It, it would mean that we would have a small development team, not 300 people or 500 like EA had. Both at Age of Conan and The Secret World, our, game, our biggest games, had at, at peak 250 people working on them full time. It's a lot of people. We want smaller. We want 20, 30, maybe 40 max something that's manageable. We want short development cycle. We don't want four or five years development time. We want one or two. We want that operationally. We don't want to pay a lot of money for bandwidth. Age of Conan launched with the 30 gig download. It's a lot of bandwidth that we need to pay. We want that the operational server costs, the amount of hardware and the, the cooling and power needed, needed for that power, we want that to be low which means we need to be very optimized on the server side. And we want low customer service costs. Now, customer service isn't the most expensive thing, but the problem there is that high customer service cost means that you made a bad game. It's a game that has bugs. It's a game that has security flaws. It's a game that we need a lot of manual work to keep players playing, to keep them interested. So this is the dream. The reality isn't like that. The reality is that we have large development teams. 
Our tools are not our tool chain. The, the, the applications we use to create data for these games are slow, unresponsive, unhelpful. Uh, people need to go through all kinds of crazy hooks to, to get data into the game. They get frustrated, they get upset, they are not productive. We have long development cycles because of unstable systems, manual, te ma manual testing, uh, all these less than, less than good tools make people cause mistakes. All the manual testing that we have just QA, quality assurance people doing, means that lots of bugs will not be caught. Um, and overall, even, p even the b at the programming language level, there aren't enough systems to assure quality. Good sound and graphics take a, take a lot of disk space, so bandwidth usage is high. Um, overall, the gigs and gigs and gigs of data are 80% focused on that area. Server costs, collision, game AI, uh, game simulation, AI, network, and other game systems use a lot of CPU. Uh, I'll go into more detail a bit later on why these specific things take, cause these problems. But these are the main areas on the server side that cost money. And in the end, what we want is to have as many players as possible playing on one physical server. Right? We don't want to have many servers. And like I mentioned, customer service uh, is, a, is a high cost because of having security issues or exploits, having bugs in game, which lead us to have another development team that the only thing they do is develop tools for customer service to be able to help the customers, which is a bit silly. Why are we making tools to help customer service, help customers we when we shouldn't even have the problems to begin with? Well, we try our best. It's important to say that the, the, pa the picture isn't horrible. We, we in the industry have spent many years on this, and we have come with ways to minimize these issues over time. Um, I want to focus in this talk on the areas that are just, they are not com computationally hard. They are just a matter of investing time and money into it. There are some problems that we have that companies just need at some point to spend the time, the manpower, to implement the solution. So having good user interface on a tool is not something I'll cover here. That's something that can be solved with today's technologies uh, and methods. But there are other things that will be computationally harder. What have we been doing? Well, the tool chains have greatly improved. Uh, in my experience in Funcom, we went from re really crude uh, access, Microsoft Access-based tools to an evolution into Python tools, and now an evolution with C-sharp and WPF tools, and a better view a better vision of what the tool should be and the tool chains are evolving greatly. Automated testing is a bit more common, so there are simple things that we are automating. Uh, when I say we, I don't say just Funcom, I mean the, the, the game industry. Um, but it's still not where it should be. There are compression techniques showing up, reducing bandwidth requirements. Um, we, mm, we use a, a third party th the technology called Substance from a French company, Allegorithmic. They do kind of like procedural textures. Um, you, can, you can check on their website, algorithm.com. It's, it's quite interesting. And they have both procedural compression, where you take a normal texture and it uses procedural tries to proceduralize parts of the texture. Uh, gives a 33% size reduction. But they also have a way that we're using now to create the textures procedural from the uh, get-go instead of you making bitmaps. That saves a lot. Unfortunately, it's not something open source or available to everyone. It's a, a commercial product, but it, it's showing up. Um, there are other good compression algorithms out there, uh, but it's quite slow, the progress in this area. That's what I feel from, from my experience. Hardware keeps on getting faster and cheaper. Hey, that's great. Cheaper hardware, faster hardware, lot, lets us run more stuff, put more features into the game. This makes designers happy. And we get, keep developing internal systems for fraud and hacking prevention. Um, in the end, those systems cause us to use more CP, CPU si uh, this time on the server, which increase other costs. But things are getting better there as well. So this talk is about you guys helping us dream. How can we get to that dream? Help us get ideas. We, we discuss a lot internally. We go to these uh, game developer conferences like GDC, as you might have heard. Um, there are game developing forums here and there. 
But overall, we have the problem that gaming companies are fairly um, proprietary about what they do. Uh, and I speak having tried to, to talk to many other companies, other CTOs, other programmers. And on a programmer to programmer level, people chat. But on a actual sharing of, of information or making a specific piece of code open source or anything like that, that doesn't happen so much. There are some great exceptions. Uh, EA released their internal STL version optimized for games as open source. That's a, that's a great thing. There are, but yeah, overall, they don't share enough. And we don't see enough coming from academia that, that is usable. Very often we see, oh, this is a really cool idea, but it's implemented in a language that no one uses in the industry. Or it's uh, a really great idea, but the implementation is buggy and doesn't really perform well. Um, and I'm not saying that that happens for everything, of course, but it is, it is very common uh, for the industry to take something that academia has made and then they have to spend the time making it industry-grade, industry um, which is a shame. I think uh, everyone will, will agree to that. So let's go through those problem areas and figure out if there are things you can help with. I'll have some ideas, some suggestions thrown in here. I'm sure that you brainstorm and have other ideas. Maybe there are already solutions to some of these things that we simply don't know. Information doesn't flow well. The internet is really big. There's lots of stuff in there, but indus industry people are always stressed and they need to release the game and maybe they just don't know about specific web pages. I'm sure I don't know about most of them. So uh, where, where do we even find information? There's a, a lot of text here, but you'll get the slides later, so uh, you'll be able to go through it. Um, tool chain, let's start there. What are the main problems that we think you can help with? We have lots of complex and different data types. So a tool chain is something that allows the, de the, the developers to create data, right? Be it a texture or a monster or a weapon or a sound effect or a map or a specific type of data that combines all of those together, which is what I call the glue data. Because at some point, you need to say that this monster has this texture and this mesh and this sound and this an animation and this particle effect and this AI and this weapon. And when you kill him, it drops this type of treasure. And when you kill him, it updates that quest. And you, you see, there are many other types of data that need to be connected. And while that is not really an object in itself, it is kind of metadata onto the monster data. So what ends up happening is that we have lots of different data types. And game developers tend to make their own data types for whatever they need as they go along. And it, then it comes down to almost the programmer level, where the programmer decides, is, am I going to write a binary format? Am I going to use XML? Am I going to use uh, JSON? I think I talk about that down here. Um, but it's not very coherent. Also, it's important to say that we have data that's not really data, that's kind of code, because it's logical data. So where do you, where's the boundary between the, the main code base, which normally is C++, there are exceptions with Java and C Sharp, and then there's the scripting, which is Lua or C Sharp or JavaScript or ActionScript or custom scripting language, and then there's the data. But this, this scripting is code. It's normally a scripting language, so the, it's interpreted and all that, but it is code. But it's also data at the same time, because that scripting is tied to that version of the monster. Because that scripting uses a particle effect. If the monster doesn't have that particle effect, that scripting doesn't work. So that script is code, and it is data. And in, we have problems really packing everything together, because everything is connected. And the connections aren't always obvious when you're trying to inspect the data. The data itself, when we are creating it and when we are running it in the game, uh, there are two very different scenarios. Crea creating and editing data means that you need to search, modify, add, and delete really fast. All the operations need to be fairly fast. But the data format itself can be bloated. As long as it's fast enough to you know, load, edit, and all that, that's good. On the game, it needs to load into memory as fast as possible, and that's it. We'll never touch it. Because once it's game, it's in game, it's a fixed blob. Sure, the game might edit it at runtime, but then normally it has its own data structures for that. But they are different 
search and type of data format problems. It means different storage, because some types of storage systems are better for um, searches and edits, and others are better for just loading up directly to memory. So like I mentioned, I mentioned data formats. These are just some, some examples of da data formats that are in use in the industry, and they are, you can just, data formats are never ending. You can just keep on going. There isn't one that really works well for all cases, and there shouldn't be, because different data has different requirements. But it is a bit very, it is very inconsistent. XML is very popular because it's very easy to use. It's very easy to open and edit, but it's extremely low performance. It's full of strings and you're parsing strings and putting it into memory is it's horrible. It fragments memory, there are the allocators don't like it, and when it comes to runtime, it's the worst thing you can do. Then the, there are popular things like JSON and Google protocol buffers, which are great. They have their own limitations. Custom binary, of course, custom text, thrift, another JSON protobuf type, and relational in the sense of relational databases, where it's, it's not a file data format, but it's a, it's a data format. And of course, creating tools takes time and slows on development. Very often, we wish there was a generic open source editor for, for example, Google protocol buffers, where a designer that needs to enter the, um, uh, all the weapons in the game into one file could just open that in that generic tool. The protocol buffer has a, has a definition, so the tool should be able to know the types of data. This is an int, this is a string, this is a, an array of strings, and they could just input the data. But there isn't. Why not? Well, no one ever made it. Um, and if someone has made it, it has been internal in a company and it's not been released. So very often, we are forced to create tools for things that should have had a tool from the get-go, from our point of view, of course. What else? Data is interconnected. Like I mentioned a bit earlier where the monster has stuff. So this is a very simple example. If we have a sword, flaming sword of chaos, yay. Attack rating, let's just say that's uh, the strength. It uses an effects package. And that's the ID. It even has two columns there. Hmm. That effects package contains this data. Again, a name, some mesh ID, some particle effect ID, some sound effects ID. OK. That particle effect contains some data, and so on and so on. So this data is referring to each other. At some point, an artist goes and changes this particle effect to be swirling ice spikes. He has no idea which weapons he has affected. There are no good ways to, to do that. This doesn't know about the weapons. The, the dependencies are this way. So many companies, ours included, have been making systems for tracking dependencies by going through all the different data types that we have, the 30, 40, 50 different ones, and analyzing the dependencies, writing custom parsers for each data type, and then putting them into a separate system that you can query. There isn't a good system for data dependencies. We've searched and searched. We got some close to it. But the fact is, in this industry, or in, in IT industry, there isn't a good system that can take random data. Of course, you'd have to write the parser yourself. Analyze the dependencies, create a huge dependency chart, and not only dependencies, but also know the properties, because this, might no, this particle effect being red or being fire isn't really a dependency of anything. But if I want to find all effects packages that are red, I need to find all particle effects, a dependency. And for that particle effect, I need to find the property, which is color red. So it's dependencies and metadata, a system that can search for that kind of things, based on random input of data, would be beneficial, beneficial, and I'm sure it would be beneficial for extreme many industries. So some ideas. While we're talking about metadata, the best one we found was one called Neo4j, which works pretty good at dependency tracking. You put data there, you say this is related to that, you can have one-way or two-way dependencies. Uh, the queries are reasonably fast. It, it's acceptable fast. What I wanted was that I, it would be Google. You go, you type, and even before you finish typing, it already knows the answer. Um, that's what I told my team when we were making the, the, ba the base system. They, they, they laughed at me. Uh, but I told them, I don't care. 
make it as close as you can. And we, we managed to, in the end, make a system that returned queries. The simple queries were around one second, and uh, the complex qu queries could take like 30 seconds. It's not really Google speed. But for the amount of time and money we invested, it was good enough. We started by using Neo4j, but Neo4j doesn't have any s good support for the metadata type things that I talked about. And I wanted to be able to find all red particles. Because at some point, the, the game director goes and says, no, 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 we don't have red in this game. This game has no red. I don't like red. So find everything that's red and make it blue. Which, yeah, it it's might sound silly, but it's extremely common. Um, so I really wanted metadata. Neo4j didn't, didn't give that. It also didn't mesh well with some other internal uh, systems we had. So it, in the end, we, we dropped it and made our own custom system using a relational DB with really advanced queries. Um, so that's a possibility. Why isn't there a fast system for tracking dependencies between data? Also, the problem that the, um, we have differ different data on the tools and different data on the game because they have different requirements means that ideally there should be some kind of storage system, database or not, let's say storage system, that knows that there are different instances of the same data, and each instance is different, ver not version, but different optimized data format. One is a data format for search and edits. One is a data format for fast load into memory. Or it might be that another one is a data format for Xbox or iOS or PC, because different platforms have different NDNS on their, on their CPUs, and they have different requirements. But there isn't a system that natively can, say, can keep multiple copies of the same object in different formats. So again, we make it ourselves. We have, in our case, we have a, an Oracle database, which is the, the source data, the data for the tools, and a file, custom file database type thing for the data that goes into the game. So data that in the tools you edit by doing SQL, at some point gets exported into a binary blob, that's what the game uses. Does it work? Yeah, it, it works. Is it an elegant, future-proof, nice, system that can be expanded to multiple uh, problem areas, not only games? No, not really. Would I like to have something a bit more nice and generic? Yeah, please. Um, again, this is the kind of system that would be helpful in many different scenarios. Most computer, big computer systems these days need some kind of way for people to author data versus people to use data in, ga in game or in the application. File formats. We are switching to use more and more Google protocol buffers. They are very good format at runtime. They pack data really well automatically. They compress well. Uh, they load fast into memory. They t the memory footprint is really low. They're a pain to edit. Um, it's a binary format. It has a text version. We're experimenting with that. There isn't, even though it's an open source thing, there isn't any tool to really edit it. Uh, so you need to either edit by hand or make some kind of tool that will output proto protocol buffers. But it is by far the best format, especially for wire transfer, sending data over the wire. It's really, really well packed. And that's what Google made it for. Internally in Google, uh, from what I've heard, they use protocol buffers for all their internal communication. JSON is also very popular. It doesn't pack as well as Google uh, protocol buffers. And the support in programming languages is much better on the web languages than on the more traditional languages like C++, which is our main development language for client and server and that, that, that area. Um, but there are many others. Thrift is another example. I personally haven't used it, but it, it sounds good. It doesn't have as many language support as JSON or protobufs. Uh, maybe there are others that I don't know about. At least there are none that are popular and have an active community. And another thing that would be interesting is a tool that not only can edit the data, but would automatically create a user interface based on the definition of the data. So I mentioned before that, for example, protocol buffers have a definition. I don't know how many of you are fami familiar with it, but there's a definition there saying this field is a string, this field is an int, this th field is a bool, things like that. Ideally, some of the XML features of you being able to mark up the fields with your data would go into such a format. So you can say, this field is a particle effect. 
and the tool would know, oh, particle effect, that's defined over there. So when you click this field to edit it, you don't want to type a number because no one wants to remember numbers. You want to have a drop-down box with a list of particle effects you can choose from. Because I know what a particle effect is. And I know that you're on a weapon, which means you only want to see weapon particle effects. You don't want to see monster particle effects because that won't work on a weapon. That should be possible again. The system the, or the language definition, the, the data format definition just needs to know that this is a data type that's been defined over there. I can find all instances of that data type over there. And if the user wants to filter on any of the flags of the data type of the properties, he can. That data format would obviously support tool type, data, uh, tool type instance where it's easy to search and modify and an optimized instance for runtime. But it's not that complicated in thought. So why hasn't it been done? I don't know. Maybe no one has seen the need for it. Or again, maybe it was done behind closed doors somewhere. No one, no one knows. I haven't seen it. Our own tools are going in that direction because it's a natural evolution to reduce tool development costs. So our tools are getting smarter at detecting what the data format is and picking from lists and having nice UIs where you can search and things like that. But it takes a lot of time, and in the industry, you always cut development short. As soon as you have something that is good enough, you stop it. So it never gets to a point where it's really, really good, because priorities change, money is expensive, <laughs> and we need to keep on going. That's on tools. On the game, most games in the world, uh, with the exception of mobile games, use C++. Why, why do we use C++? Well, we have full control over how things work at the hardware level. It has lots of drawbacks, but you do have full control. You have the good access to the render APIs and all that. But C++ could be so much greater. What, what is it that it lacks compared to C Sharp, Java, even the web, more, more web-friendly uh, languages? Well, there, aren't a good, there isn't a good set of libraries that are memory friendly. This is one of my main complaints with things coming from academia, is that things just fragment memory all over the place. And in our games, we very quickly reach the 32-bit address space limit on Windows, which is 2 gigs. If you have around, even if you have 4 gigs of RAM installed or 8 gigs of RAM on Windows 32-bit, you're going to have around 2 gigs of address space. You can start Windows with a special flag that will give you 3 gigs. But that's it. Well, 2 gigs isn't a lot. Uh, and we're talking addressable space, right? Uh, and with 2 gigs, if you think that going into a map, just the assets, the textures and meshes in the map, take 500 megs. And then you have 300 megs of sound. And let's say you have now 300 megs of other data. That's only 1.1 gig. But in our experience, it's very likely that the games will crash out of memory at that point. Not because they run out of memory, but because they do a malloc and it malloc returns zero. It cannot find a block that big when you're allocating one megabyte. And that's because the memory is fragmented. One of the big headaches I had never heard about until I started working in, in the industry. Um, the, the friendly STD ST or STL uh, has really great containers. Boost has really great containers. But they are none of them are really memory friendly. They let you specify your own allocator, which helps. Well, but it would help more if they were just memory friendly to begin with. Why not? No one wants an unoptimized app. Even if you're doing a, something that takes 50 megs of memory, it's nice if the memory is all contiguous. EA, EA released their uh, version of STL, which addresses specifically this problem. It's much more memory friendly. It's what they use on consoles and all that. Uh, it also has faster searches and all that, but it only covers the part of STL that EA used. It doesn't cover everything. It's a, it's a good step in the right direction because it's open source and there are people using it a lot. We are using it in some subsystems, but it's also the naming is different, the compatibility, it, uh, you need to change the code because the methods are, have different names and things like that, so it's a bit of a pain. C++ kept compatibility with C and kept compatibility with old versions of the standard. So there's a lot of things in C++ that are accepted by the compiler. 
maybe there's a warning that is accepted, but it shouldn't be, at least from a game developer point of view. We want the language to be more restrictive. We want to prevent people from making mistakes. You can override methods uh, with virtual and then you hide the, the, the declaration. You can do a void, void pointer cast to something and mess around with it as much as you want. You can do so much. It's, it's ridiculous, the amount of stuff you can do with C++ that you shouldn't. My idea there, which I mentioned next page, I'll, so I'll get there in a second. Um, C++ 11 is a great step forward. It introduces really interesting and useful uh, constructs into the, into the language, like auto, which is, if you've used the new C++, it's, it's bliss to use that in, in loops when you, have a, you need to declare an iterator and you have this long iterator declaration. Now you replace it with auto and the compiler figures out the type. It saves a lot of time and, and headaches. But again, it adds features. All the other ones stay there. So you can keep on doing the same things. And of course, C++ doesn't, doesn't have as many good libraries as C Sharp or Java. Um, C++ feels m is, it's a more open environment, so we have a lot more of everything. You have a lot more unfinished things because it's harder to finish a library in C++. You need to worry about memory, about uh, memory overrides. You need to worry about too much. It's a pain to create a DLL because it doesn't have good uh, introspection on the language. So that's, that's a problem that overall, I think it's important to keep in mind. Universities focus a lot on, on C Sharp and Java. It depends a lot on the university, of course. But uh, there's been a, a, a change towards C Sharp and Java. So a lot of nice, interesting ideas get the implemented there. And while a large part of the IT industry uses those technologies, for more performance intensive applications, they are very often not used. I'm not saying that these languages are bad for performance intensive applications, it really depends on the scenario, uh, but very often people use C++. So the result is that it's very easy to make costly mistakes. It's very easy to make applications that crash or that are slow or unnecessarily or that just have bugs. I might be going a bit too slow. So I talked a bit about STL, improving the standard libraries, the open source projects out there to have a uh, better memory uh, footprint and to have better, faster searches and, and usage would be good. Regarding C++ itself, why don't we have support for a subset or something like that? Kind of like a strict mode. I would like to be able to go to the compiler and say, no, I don't want people to do C style casts. I want them to do C++ style casts. They're safer. But the compiler accepts it, but I want to force it to this specific mode where we are doing modern C++. We are not doing ancient C++ or, or C. That shouldn't be very, very, very strange. It means that we would have to go to, it. if there, that would be there, I would enforce it. And that would mean that we would have to go and fix our code, and that would be great we would fix bugs. What if we go a step further and we can you have a this nice tool that you can go and click buttons to enable and disable parts of the language? Maybe you can put uh, more checking into the, into the language. You can, you can say um, the class name needs always to start always with capital letter. Or should the compiler check that? Why not? It is important for the business. Having code written in all kinds of ways is complex, and doing manual checking to make sure people write code in the, in the proper way fails and is really boring. There are tools out there to check that, yes, but why do we need all these separate things? Can I have one nice tool where I can specify my language requirements for C++? Maybe, it's, maybe with C-Lang, it's going nicely. C-Lang is really helping. Maybe there we'll have something. That would be a nice area. We don't need to go and change GCC. Keep it for compatibility, evolve into c -line. Why not? Testing. Testing is really complicated. We're, done, we're doing more and more automated testing, but MMOs are complex games. They have gameplay scenarios that, even though they are not non-deterministic, they feel like it. There are so many variables that you just go, oh, this is random. It's not random. But it is really hard. 
We need to test the data, as in data consistency checks, seeing if the data refers to other data that doesn't exist anymore. We need to search the, uh, check the logical data, because it's kind of like code, but with da very many data references. We need to check the code, and we need to check ev everything together. And then add some network latency, low frame rate, low memory or disk, disk swapping, frustrated players punching their keyboard, then yeah, it blows up. And then people come to you and say, hey, I want my money back. Or even worse, surprisingly, even worse, they go to the internet and start bad mouthing the game, which makes other players don't not get into the game. For us, that's a lot worse than people c getting their money back, because that just affects one. Everyone does manual testing. They have departments of just testers. Poor people that end up suffering through hours and hours of buggy games. Um, I praise their patience. It's it's very frustrating, and it's very it fails too much. There are too many things that go through. The amount of bugs that those people don't see anymore because they've been seeing so many bugs that they, they don't see that the character when he's moving over uh, on, on stairs that he jitters. They've seen that all along. They just assume that everyone knows that. No, I, I, me as the programmer, I don't know that. I just know that you told me that when I swing, it crashes. So I'm fixing that. I don't know that it jitters. It's less important than the crash, but I still want to know. They just, as because they are humans, they get blind. Because they are humans, they tend to repeat the same play patterns, more or less. So they don't catch specific <laughs> other bugs. That will happen once every 10 hours. But if that crashes the server, it affects everyone. So the ideal thing would be for us to not only get better at testing, and that's more of an internal industry problem that we need to get better at testing, but we would like to see when we do a change in code or data, what will that impact? What's the risk? As a manager, 10 submits, 10, 10 changes have been introduced, and we're going to patch that out to live. Live is the live game, right? What's running? Um, how can I ev evaluate the, the risk? What do we do now? Well, we ask people. So, Bob, how, how likely do you think this is that it's going to break and you're going to call you at 2 in the morning? Nah, that's not going to happen. It's fine. This is a minor fix. Yeah, how often has that happened? Uh, too many times. We're really blind to the risk of a code change. What if we have a system, kind of like a compiler, that knows the internal structure of the code and can say, hey, you change this line here, and this line is using a function. That function is called from there, there, and there, and this function accesses this, this, and this. And this function is doing uh, a memory operation, is writing memory. Writing memory, there's some risk there. It's affecting, and it's being called from, and it's calling these, these, and these. So if there is a memory overwrite on that line, these things will be affected. It's in the character attack code. So it won't, even if it writes memory, it won't get to the, to the movement code or the collision code. So the collision code is safe. If we knew that, we could tell the, the manual testers, hey, for this build, you don't need to test collision. We know it's not affected. But we know you need to test the combat code, because that's where we put the change. And maybe you need to test the, the, tr the trade post, the auction house code, where you put things for sale. Because somehow that code is used close to it. A system like that, that would analyze the code, see the internal relations of the modules, and give a risk analysis based on the changes, should be possible with today's knowledge of internal languages. That would be extremely useful. That would save so much time and money that it's not even funny. It would be millions and millions and millions. Another idea is that we can have a bot, an AI, that goes and plays the game. and we code it in a way that it goes there, finds a monster. It, it's in a map, finds the closest monster, attacks it. If the monster drops loot, so if there's a an item reward, it picks it up. Then it finds another monster and does it. And we combine that with code, code coverage. So we see which parts of the code base have been touched when the, the bot did that. And then the bot can then go and say, hey, even though I've, I was doing all this, it seems like uh, uh, I did never use 
the AOE abilities. AOE, area of effect, is when you do an attack that affects an area, right? Versus an attack that hits one target. So either the bot would be smart enough to have an array of actions that it can choose from to test all the scenarios, or at least would have the information available for the coder to write another test. But ideally, it would be for things like the bot sees that he did an AOE, but he didn't stress the code that does an AOE when he's jumping. What happens if you're jumping and there's an area of effect attack? It should, it should work, right? But if we didn't touch that area of the code, if there is a specific code path that we're not stressing, that could be information for the, the artificial in intelligence to know, I need to test this next. That would be extremely useful. It's a smarter bot that knows about the code. It's not just smarter in the sense that it learns from what it's doing, it knows about the internal. It's kind of like a white box bot. If you know white box versus black box testing, where you know the internals, this would be a white, a white box bot. More AI and machine learning ideas. I, I, my background is AI, uh, so I really like that. So if I talk about AI, it's because I have a tendency for that. What if we have high performance metrics meaning the server performance, memory usage, the client performance, memory usage, the perform performance over time, uh, the performance over time with players, without players, uh, when we have lots of maps running at the same time and without. What if we had all that data being logged to a database somewhere? And we had a system that could look at the data and see trends and issue warnings. Hey, this might be an issue here. It seems that when we have 67 players jumping at the same time, server frame rate goes down. And this has happened, where <laughs> it's ridiculous, but if all the players go at the same time and push the jump button, it's very likely that there will be a small spike, because the collision code suddenly has to do work all at the same time, maybe all at the same area. The network code has to do work, because if we all jump at the same time, we need to be notified that everyone else jumped. So it's a squared uh, complexity problem. So there will be a problem there. Normally, we know that, how do we find that out? By pure chance. Either the players do that, and we are paying attention, or the players do that in a, in a, in a way to gain a benefit in-game, and then we learn later from other players complaining that those guys are getting an advantage. In Age of Conan, uh, there was a very popular PvP, player versus player guild uh, in Russia, that was winning a lot, and we're like, what the hell is happening? Players were complaining. Turns out they had found, found out that if they all, at the same time, used an area of effect spell, and they were all together, that would swamp the server so much that uh, fallback in the server would kick in and say, hey, we are too busy, we can't handle this, so if you, uh, the defender of this fight will win because we can't handle it. So they never lost a battle when they were defending because they found out, they, that's what we call an exploit, they found out a vulnerability in the system that would give them an unfair advantage. We found that out months later they s uh, after they started using it. A system that could look at the performance metrics and infer a pattern would have warned us earlier. There's another nice problem to that, which we always hit. How can we store so much data? It would be, have to be some system that takes the data, digests it, and throws away most of it, or compresses it, or does everything. Data storage for metrics is what makes the industry not have metrics on their games. The same problem happens down here. What if we had a system that would let us see that the players are leveling up, so they're getting stronger, much faster than our target curve? Uh, yeah, well, you just need to log the data and plot some charts. But again, what we want is a system that could infer that they seem to be going too fast. We don't want to know after the fact. We want to know before the fact, so we can react to it faster. So it needs to look, look, look at the data, see the patterns, but it needs to store the data. It needs to be fast enough to analyze the data. And then it needs to warn us. Is this easy? Uh, not really. Is it something that could be done if enough people put their minds to it? I believe so. Would this be useful in other scenarios that are not games? Of course. Games have the advantage that they have 
really tough money constraints. They're not like the defense industry. And they have the advantage that they can fail. It's not like the defense industry, where the missile might explode in when being handled. So games are actually a quite good place for ideas to be tested. Don't tell this to my CEO, but it, you know, the amount of money you lose on a game if it goes bad is nothing compared to the amount of money you'd lose if it's medicine or defense. Because then it's not just money, it's lives. So they are a great, sta a great place to experiment. The cost is lower. Bandwidth. Um, time to praise critical. Players have less and less attention. Everyone wants to click a web page and they are playing. They want to get to their phone and play immediately. They don't want to wait two hours for the game to download. Are you crazy? Go tell that to a 14-year-old and see if he wants to, to wait for a game for two hours. Of course not. 30 gigs in size, that's a lot. Traditional approaches, well, we have less data. But that lowers the quality, lowers the value. Less people buy it, then it doesn't help. Split the data into some kind of packages, things that can be downloaded sequentially. OK, you need just this much to get into the game, and then this much to get to the next level, and so on and so forth. Trim the data. Remove the data that's not really necessary. This only works if you have a good system for dependencies. If I make a test map, because I'm testing my gameplay ideas there, that's not going to go into the game. Most games out there pack that data together with the rest of the game. Maybe they are manually excluded if you know it's a test map. But if you don't have the dependencies, you can't really trim it. Because my test map, I might have created a monster that I use in my test map. If I delete the map, the monster is still in the database. Do we know where that monster is used? No. Can we remove it? No. Keep it just in case it's used somewhere. Anarchy Online has 450 game maps. Do you think we know what's in them? No. We have no idea. So we include everything. Maybe 50 of those maps are test maps. We remove some of them, but... So what are the ideas? See my procedural data types. I mentioned procedural textures, or smart textures, like they call them. Um, and that was the first version of their, their idea, where you make everything based on mathematical formulas, and everything is generated. Guess what? The industry didn't take. It didn't like it. It's too much work to make a pure procedural texture. So what they have now that works really great, and we're using, is that you combine, you have small bitmaps, maybe just two bit, two colors, black and white, or whatever color you want. And then you combine that with procedural uh, formulas to then generate patterns that end up looking really good at a much lower development cost than the pure procedural and a much lower uh, disk, disk space size. We, d we save around 95% of uh, disk space by using this thing on textures now. Um, the game we're working on now called Lego Minifigures, it's with the Lego brand, though those small bags of minifigures you can buy everywhere, is using this, and it's the, the s disk space savings are gigantic. So with pure proce procedural textures, a two megabyte texture would take two megabyte compressed DDX compressed texture uh, would take um, two kilobytes, I think, three kilobytes, something like that. With the, the semi-procedural approach, it takes between 50 and 200 kilobytes. So the savings are gigantic. The advantage with other p advantage with procedural data types in general is that you can modify them at runtime. Because the color of the texture is just a value in the formula. So if you need to change the, the floor from being this brown to being green at runtime, you can. You can even interpolate and make it smooth out to a new color. So you don't need two textures. You can just have one that you modify at runtime. Why don't we have that for more data types? Like sound. A lot of sound could be generated like meshes, and I know there, are, there is some work being done on this area for, for models and meshes, but I haven't seen anything even co remotely close to be industry ready. Maybe even for other data types that I'm not thinking about now. I, s I talked about progression and curves and things like that. Maybe instead of creating items for players at multiple levels that mimic a curve, maybe you can just have one item and define a curve to generate the others. But in the case of an item, we're talking about a few kilobytes of data anyway, so maybe it's not worth it. It's interesting anyway. We should scale. We should scale the capabilities to the client. Um, everyone is going more multi-platform. We are working on getting our, our engine on uh, 
10 minutes. I need to speed up. Uh, the idea here is that we, we need to detect the capabilities of the client and then downscale if needed or upscale. A bit like we do with video streams, but video streams is very easy. It's, it's compared to the, re to the stuff here. Here you need to, to think of the bandwidth, yes. Does it have a sound system? Yes. Is it 7.1 channels or is it two channels? Okay. Uh, rendering wise, what kind of capabilities do we have? What about CPU wise? What about I.O.? Can we have a large data type that we push to memory because we have not so much memory or is, is our disk drive slow? All that would have to be considered to make a really good system to scale. So even if we just have an open source library that allows you to give a rating per area that we then, the industry could use to use that to smartly download what, what it needs, it would be extremely useful. More compression techniques, LZMA is great as a general compressor, but why don't we have a mesh specific compression type? We know these are triangles, can we compress it better? We know this is sound, and for sound, AUG is pretty good and there are some others. So it's not the best I example. Um, for textures, we have some procedural ones, but for, for different data types, we can have specialized compression. And better knowledge of data dependency so that we can download just what we need as we need it. Maybe scale to the network connection again. So we know that we're going to need this in half an hour, approximately, but it is 100 megs, so we should start downloading it now. Server performance. We need to do a lot of computation on the server side. Why? <coughs> For security reasons. If we if we put this kind of uh, areas, or network is, is different, but if we, if we put gameplay, collision, uh, scripting onto the clients, it means that I can go reverse engineer my client and edit it in memory and say, hey, every time character name equals Rui, the combat formal result is win. So I always win. You can't have that. The server needs to val validate. Same thing with collision. If the server doesn't check collision, which is the case in the first person shooters, you can do wall hacks. You can move through. You can hack your client to move through collision, which breaks the game rules. And because this is a sub sub subscription game, players pay to have a good experience. They don't want other people to abuse. Another extremely cost, cost, uh, high cost area is uh, network messages. If I mentioned before, it's a, it's a squared uh, complexity problem. We have to see what other people around us are doing. Servers do uh, manage to tackle large maps with lots of people by separating those into areas, fixed or not. In our case, we have dynamic areas that are sh shrink and grow. It's a very crude algorithm, but could we have something th there to make this faster? Probably. Also, most server architectures rely on an entire game map being run in a single process. It's, he e it's so much easier. You have a map, in the map is a list of objects. Each object gets a call to its run method every, every game fr engine frame, and it just goes from there. But then, if you want 10,000 players in a map, uh, it might just not run. The server isn't fast enough. These days, instead of having more clock cycles, we have more cores. Then you need to make that process be multi-threaded. Oh, do you need to go into multi-threading here as well? It just makes it so much more complicated, costs so much more. So why are we even doing the architecture this way? The architecture is wrong. We shouldn't do multi-threading. We should mu do multi-process in a way that scales. And I think I talk about that here. Why don't we get a different architecture where we don't rely on the concept of a map with a list of objects, and instead you have workers that take an object and process its data? It's not that simple because if I am attacking um, another player, I need to the server processing that needs to load those two players. What if that player at the same time is being attacked by someone else and by someone else and by someone else? Then w in which work server would that information be processed? And where, how would we transmit the data? If I have a work package here about the player being attacked and a work package here about the player, do I care about the, uh, another character that's 800 meters away? Probably not. Visually, I'll probably not even see it. Does the server need to know that? Maybe. What about if we're talking about 3D positions? Should I, in a, in a high performance scenario, should I have to get the updates if all of you start jumping? Maybe you're relatively close, but if we don't have enough CPU, that sh probably should scale down so I get less updates. Um, there isn't a good system there. There isn't a good system for the application to be smart about network updates to clients. 
And how can we offload the servers and still keep the security level? Could we do peer-to-peer -peer game rule checking if we are all playing together? Could we go to the extent where our architecture says that there is no server and the game state is kept in the cloud of clients, which would mean that to prevent hacking, we would all have to check if someone did an action and that action is invalid. So instead of you telling the server, hey, can I do this? You'd say, I'm doing this. And the other clients that are connected to you would say, no, you're not. That's not valid. Could something like that be done? A peer-to-peer -peer validation check? Yes, I know of companies that do that. Um, it's a Korean company, can't remember the name. They have a game called Vindictus. Vindictus is a very simple, it only, it only has four players at a time in a team, and they do peer-to-peer -peer checking when you're in a dungeon. But they design the game in a way that even if you hack, it doesn't matter much. So they design the game around it. But in that, in that engine, in that game, if you hack uh, three out of the four clients and you go in, 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 and play, you can make yourself always win. They have a voting system. The other clients need to vote if they think the uh, action is acceptable or not. It's a good idea. They designed the game around that. Maybe that's the way to go. I haven't thought enough about it. It's an interesting area. But even the f the just keeping the game state in the cloud, would that be possible? Maybe having small server somewhere that stores the state once in a while for in case many clients go offline? That sounds interesting. Customer service. I talked about why we need customer service. Um, one of the big problems with the effect, uh, e efficiency of cu customer service is that they don't know the extent of a problem. Someone comes to them and is a really loud person, maybe they call them and say, this is completely unacceptable, I paid 50 bucks for the game, I can play, this guy is ruining my experience. Every time I log into the game, he comes to me and kills me. Okay, fairly common again. Players can be very annoying. Um, maybe there is a specific area in the world that should have a, a system that doesn't allow you to be killed when you get into the game, so you have an op a possibility to go around, right? Should there be one area in the world or should there be a hundred? How many players does this affect? They don't know. They just know that there's a guy really loud, so they're going to help him because he's being really loud on the phone. Another system to int intelligently monitor the, uh, the game and keep an eye out. Imagine that the customer service representative can say, hey, this guy is being corpse camped, which is the, the term for it. Every time he responds, he gets killed. Respond, kill. Um, let's enable the, the, the monitoring for this, or the system would enable it. Then they would, uh, the system would go, oh, there is now a count of 300 cor corpse camp per hour. Is that acceptable? Maybe not. What if the system uh, can analyze more things, things that the players aren't reporting? It's very common that you get, go to geometry and you get stuck because the collision system has a bug, right? Um, many players complain, many players don't complain. What they do? Depends on the game. Maybe they can teleport back to, the, to another place. Maybe they kill themselves, so they respawn in another place that's safe, but they don't they, they work around it, they don't tell anyone. If, or they quit, they stop paying. Uh, and then we know that in the quit message, I stopped subscribing because I got stuck all the time. Um, we could have a system that would m monitor that. Getting stuck is a complicated problem. It means that the player is inside geometry, but the collision system doesn't know that. Because if not, it wouldn't have gotten stuck in the first place. It means the player didn't move, for a specific moment on time, or maybe he did. Maybe he fell into a hole and he can't get out of the hole. That's still considered being stuck. But he's moving. So how can we monitor these kind of problems? I don't know. But that would greatly help customer service because then they could tell the developers, hey, people are getting stuck a lot. Or, you know what, this guy's being really loud about getting stuck, but it only happens to him. We know that the monitoring system didn't find more cases, so that's fine. Keep on working on the crashes instead. And why don't we have an artificial intelligence-based system that would look at customer service and do the first round of interface with the players? It would see that lots of players are getting stuck. So when you type slash help or click the help button, the first thing it says is uh, it auto-prioritizes the issues. You, are you stuck? Click here to reset. It could look at what's happening in-game, both reported by customer service and not, and prioritize 
the help issues. Maybe it would even automatically broadcast. Oh, the server performance is being low. It would broadcast to everyone, so everyone has on their screens. Um, Please be patient, server performance is a bit low, we are working on it. Even if we're not, it doesn't matter. What matters is that the players need to feel that they're getting what they pay for. And they pay for attention, they want attention. They want to feel like we care about them, that one player in a million. And we do, because we want them to stay, and a, a happy player will bring more players in. That would be interesting. That would save a lot of money. I hope I'm right on time. Um, another point I want to make is that we should talk more. We, the industry and academia. Uh, I feel like I want to, but <laughs> there's never time. That's everyone's problems. But with the internet, there should be forums or groups or places where we can discuss. The industry very often doesn't want to reveal what they are doing, but they really want help sometimes. And then they're very helpful. When we have a problem, we disclose more information. So let's communicate more. Let's try to find a way for us to share information, share problems. Maybe even a way for more universities to know what kind of problems we have. And I'm focused more on MMORPGs. Other companies that foc focus on racing games will have completely different problems. Or not, not all of them will be different, but they'll have many other different problems. Problems that maybe can be interesting also to other industries, like the actual automotive uh, industry. So yes, that was my talk. Feel free to contact me if you have questions, ideas. If you know about a solution to a problem that I don't know of, uh, that would be great. And that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I hope it inspired quite a few of you for the game industry. We are going to have a coffee break, break very soon and then restart the next session with a five minute delay. But if anybody has some serious problems now before the coffee break, it, please uh, raise your hand. Otherwise, Rui is going to be here for a few minutes more. Unfortunately, he has to run off and do work yeah, very soon. Hi, um, thank you for the interesting talk. Um, I've heard some of your aspects about the memory management and it really sort of pushes towards maybe rethinking some of the undergraduate educations in computer science. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but um, I was uh, struck by um, your um, uh, uh, problem about the software testing. Mm -hmm. And I was sort of wondering, um, I have heard uh, over the last four weeks Mm -hmm. Some very interesting talks from software engineering community uh, on uh, interactive software testing. Mm -hmm. The ASPLOS, UPSLA sort of conferences currently are getting very excited about exactly the same problems that you are currently indicating. So University of Illinois basically, for example, has a, a, a professor, Danny Digg, who does sort of interactive uh, uh, software testing where some of the mundane software testing is done by the system automatic, mm -hmm. uh, but then basically there is the programmer in the loop, user in the loop, uh, to actually really sort of maybe give hints mm -hmm. to the system. Uh, I have heard the talk from Tao Shi, maybe you know, so very famous software engineer from North, uh, North uh, Carolina State University, very similar on, on these levels of compilers and uh, software testing with user in the loop and so, some kind of, so I was sort of wondering, are you looking into those areas? Uh, is that something common practice in software engineering and these problems that you mentioned go beyond what currently the software engineers are looking at? Yes, so um, the gaming industry is probably the, the of in the software area, it's probably the, the one that tests the least. Um, I know many people in the normal IT, as I normally call it, the, the business that's not gaming, and their testing is a lot more m mainstream. Uh, unit testing, especially, is very mainstream. Uh, user testing is growing. In the gaming industry, we have a problem that user testing is difficult because the users aren't close by. 
when we have a game that's going to target 2 million people across the world, um, it's hard to get those people around. It's expensive. It costs money to fly in people from different countries because we're talking about the entire world. Uh, and when we've done user testing before it, we always had great results. But the cost, time, and money was always deemed too high. Um, so I've been turning myself more towards automated testing either with artificial intelligence that we can direct or feature level testing. A bit of not unit testing because it's not so small as unit testing, but more taking a big feature like the auction house and doing the big actions there. Um, it's a shame that the gaming industry doesn't test more, but it's also because it's a bit more complicated. So I have to say that it's one of the areas I'm the weakest at myself, just because the, the there's never enough push from management to, to do it, uh, because it's something that doesn't give immediate results. It's something that gives long-term results. And because it's ve a very fast-paced industry compared to business, uh, it th those things get dropped. But it, it overall, I see the improvements. Even on the business, five years ago, there was a lot less testing. So eventually, it will mature into something we can use in gaming. But I feel that from the gaming side, we should be able to develop smarter artificial intelligence type testing that can look at big, big patterns. So the methodology of testing is good from the, the IT side, but the more large scale, big data type testing is better should come from our side. That's what I, I feel. Yeah, I don't. Um, just two quick things. Number one, you mentioned you were talking about your clients being able to scale when networks are bad or whatever, mm -hmm. and you had a kind of comment where, you know, video streaming is easy. If that was easy. true, easy. <laughs> a lot of us probably wouldn't be here. It's, 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 it's no, no, it's <laughs> easy. Yeah. Easier. Easier, yeah. yeah. So, like, I can see from your, your presentation, um, like, you came with a shopping list of things you want us to do. I you're looking for help with. But yes. is, is Funcom bringing um, um, resources or funding or, you know, contests or, or whatever that w will get us involved or, you know, will help us to get where you yes. want us to be? It's a g yeah, I should have mentioned it's a good point. Uh, I shouldn't just come in and ask. Uh, funding, funding uh, no. Funcom isn't, has been through some rough periods. Uh, so maybe other companies would be able to do that, but no, not us, not at this time. But we have done before, and we are willing to spend some time on it and data. We have data from our games that we can give. We have done that uh, for a TCP/IP uh, research project where we gave big data dumps, uh, and we we can we can be guinea pigs. I am very open to these things, so I am willing to take experimental ideas and test them. So not in the form of money, but in, in the form of some uh, developer time and in the form of willingness to take research ideas into more real world scenarios. That's what I think we specifically can contribute. And I think overall, mo most companies in the business will be able to do that. <laughs>